This morning, Truth Social, parent uh, Trump Media and Technology Group will begin trading on the NASDAQ under DJT. Jim, there's a lot wrapped up in here, including the potential for waivers for him to sell some of his stake early. Yeah, and as, as long as it goes up, I think people will say whatever broker you could go to, they'll say, look, you know what, I might stock you out and take some money you can borrow. It would be a very hard situation because you would need uh, the faith in the collateral. And this stock is going up on very, very light volume this morning. Uh, I mean, really, right? I mean, maybe 10,000 shares moved it up. Let's talk more about it in a minute. Let's get the opening bell here and the CNBC real-time exchange. And the big board is ATS a builder of factory automation systems. And at the NASDAQ, it's Fox Corporation and the United Football League. Huh. Speaking of which, we mentioned uh, James Gorman coming on later to talk yeah. about media and Disney. I think that's fabulous. Uh, in my interchange back and forth, he's very involved. Uh, and I think those of us who know him is a very thoughtful exec. He will provide uh, great intel. I don't think Nelson Peltz, who uh, obviously wants to be on the board, W would disagree with that. I think that Gorman is someone with tremendous insight about finance, and I think that they need that. Yeah, it'll be a nice uh, duopoly of the media stuff and, of course, legacy banking questions, yes, too. Yes, yeah? I do think that uh, the last deal wasn't a great deal. I know Disney hates when I say that, but it, it just was, it cost too much. The, your, the point on, your point on light volume on DJT is interesting as we see the shares rocket higher here. There's also a lot of attention being paid to the light revenue, you could argue, uh, in the last in the first nine months of last year. That's a very polite way to put it. Yeah. I think that they this is a very expensive stock. Uh, the people who are buying it, I think it's more like, it's almost like it's a keepsake. Uh, that the people who uh, want to support Donald Trump know that as this goes higher, he's able to raise more money. Of course, the amount that he owes was cut back yesterday that he has, that he has yep. to put up. Yep. Uh, so I think this is surprising a lot of people. Uh, you can't borrow it to short it. Uh, it would seem like a natural short uh, because it doesn't have, as you said, a lot of, um, there's no earnings power. It doesn't even have that much revenue. But I do think that this is something that the higher it goes, the more likely Donald Trump can go to the, bo to the board and say, listen, guys, you know what? The market wants it. Let's unlock it so I can sell. Now, the board is, as some people say, it's a captive board. But his son's on the board. Sure. But that's what I, if I were uh, President Trump, which, by the way, I am most certainly not. <laughs> okay, thanks. thanks for the clarification. <laughs> yes. Uh, if I were king of the forest, I would go in <laughs> and say to the board, there, people want stock. Let's un let's unlock this, uh, and that's what I would do if I were on the board. I would unlock it. We'll keep a close eye on that name today. Uh, Tesla's up three percent plus, Jim. Isn't that uh, interesting? Given the fact that Tony Saganegi yes. just cut his price target, goes to one twenty and ninety three on a discounted free cash free cash flow basis. Yeah, I said last night that this, if you're going to get involved, you should get involved at this level. We've got a new one coming out. Uh, it's not like that that Musk is standing still. He's not a person standing still. Uh, I also think that the the death of the EV is largely uh, overdone, although Fisker was delisted today. Yes. Which is very important because I don't know how, how much staying power uh, that we'll see from Lucid. I think Lucid is one that I visited them, and I just don't think that they have the sales that, uh, that can keep them open. Rivian has a lot of sales, and that's very important. Although uh, yesterday, Mizuho cut Rivian, cut Neo. Yeah, big brutal. piece in the Times about how EVs got politicized by yeah. both administrations in the last uh, couple of years. It, it did. I do think that in the end, to quote Larry Fink, we are going to have to cut back on emissions, but we also have to accept the fact that fossil fuels here to stay for now. So we need a pragmatic energy policy, meaning that we're not we shouldn't just jam EVs down people's throat. We don't have the infrastructure yet. I think that that's one of the, the biggest fears is infrastructure. I remember what Steve Schur said in, in his, his departure at, at Hertz, which is that these aren't loved. Right. They're tried and not loved. Really quick, as we continue that conversation, uh, DJT paused briefly here for volatility. We'll watch it. Speaking of cars, Jim, uh, the CFO of GM on with Phil LeBeau last hour, saying they're on track for 200 to 300,000 EVs this year. Look, this stock has been on fire. If you look at what Mary Barr has done here, this is one of the strongest charts in the book, and it still sells for less than six times earnings. So Mary Barr, by the way, is on the Disney board. Mary Barr has done such a great job. Does she get talked about? No. 
Should she be in the conversation of, of a broader market? Look at that. That's a broader, that is not a chart of Alphabet. That's a chart of GM. And it's been a huge winner. It doesn't really have much of a dividend. I just think that she, uh, that Mary Barr pivoted very quickly, uh, made some changes with EV, made some changes, uh, of, of course, with self-driving uh, and the problems in San Francisco. But she is, she seems to have the cars and trucks people want. Now, uh, uh, Jim Farley, Ford's going to speak. My travel trust owns Ford. It's not been as good as GM. It's time for Jim Farley to tell a great story. And the great story, by the way, is are the F-150s and the Bronco. Maybe he'll do it. Maybe, you know, it's not bad, but it's not. I hate Jim Farley, close your ears. It's not what bar Boris delivery. Mm -hmm. wow. This is all happening at the B of A Auto Summit. We'll also hear from Lear uh, today, along with GM and Ford. Um, speaking of analysts and conferences, UPS, Jim, with some fresh three-year targets. Well, I, I think we want Carol Tomei to do better. We want a duopoly. This, at one point, the stock was up five. It's given things back. I think that Raj Subramanian has got to be... Uh, 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 saluted here because he was able to do what some every so many people want to do which is take a lot of different unwieldy division silos like think about Disney silos and uh, just put them together in the stock is straight up this again FedEx is what I'm talking about the broader market how when you look at what Raj has done he is a superman he has just done remarkable things. Look at that. Don't yeah. you want to be in that? That, by the way, is not Amazon. So that's the broadening you're talking about. It, and it's remarkable and terrific, and we got to celebrate it, not just because Larry, Larry Fink made me feel guilty that I'm not doing enough to talk about how cool <laughs> the markets are. I want to embrace the capital markets. So you, you embrace FedEx? Who doesn't know FedEx? What I mean, talk about... Like, you go to a younger person, you say, um, what do you think of FedEx? They say, well, you know, it's really expensive. I don't use it. No! Go buy some. Raj is remarkable. I mean, go over that call. I mean, do you know that the revenues there are awful? They're flat to down. And he made so much money. And when the revenues turn up, he will make a fortune. I want that stock for my chapel trust, and I just haven't been able to pull the trigger. Interesting. Cal it's a little more challenged. They, they took 70% of the business that UPS lost to FedEx because of the possible strike. Yes. They kept at FedEx. That's a remarkable figure that heretofore has not been talked about. Yeah, they definitely pounced when things were uh, uncertain. They really did. Yeah. They really did. There's a lot of things that are working. We haven't talked about Boeing yet, and people keep talking about Larry Kolb. I think, Larry, can we let him finish the job, please? <laughs> Get for no over there. I mean, he was quoted extensively. I wanted to tell Larry, hey, Larry, listen, the more you talk about it, the more people think you're going there. Yes. A and I just think that He's finally got GE where he can just relax and make a lot of money. <laughs> Don't charge. Just memo to Larry, will you please take it easy? You're a national treasure. Don't <laughs> take on some job that's so big. A lot of headlines is, is Culp ready for his next challenge. Yeah, Although, Stiefel does say that it's like more likely now that they go for an outsider. Uh, as, whereas before, maybe Stephanie Pope was being teed up. A lot of people are saying that, that, that Pope is tainted. Uh, and that if you really want to know how to get out of this situation, you pick someone from way, way out of the field. Uh, that's why Larry Cole was mentioned so often. And maybe you need, I remember when I did the uh, my show at the Air Force Academy. I mean, let's get, maybe we need a, a general in there, an admiral. Mm. We gotta have someone who is, uh, who frankly is unapproachable, you know, so, Lily White clean, you know, Lily White not being, you know, referring to the plan because it, I think that that would be great to have someone out of, really out of the cultural realm because they need someone who is so fresh and so clear headed and so diverse and understanding the problems of all the different constituencies. I don't know. I'd like someone who's way from left field, who's different and not part of this culture. This culture seems very damaged to me. Right. Let's get someone who's fresh and different and tough. Interesting. By the way, you see the resumption of trade on DJT there, now up some 34%. Jim, in, in terms of us... Wow. I mean, look at this, will you? What's that? No, the DJT. I mean, if I were Donald Trump, he says, now it's 8 million shares. This is the moment where you say that you have an obligation to release more shares. And I've got shares that I'd like to release. Yep. And that's, the board can do that. The board can say no, but the board, I think if, I'm not sure where Mr. Trump's head is, 
but this is a moment where where he could very easily say, look, uh, the stock's up 286 percent. No one would mind if I sold stock, so please let me do it. Now, he may say, I don't need to uh, because he's prideful, but I don't know. I think that anybody, no one would begrudge him if he went to the board and say, look, I'd like to be, have some stock right. released. Well, there was a nice piece in the FT this yesterday about the ratio of insider selling to buying. I mean, it's fairly bearish, you could argue, but yeah, it hasn't it stopped some of these names from powering higher. Meta well, is a good example. Well, I just think if you had you, you own stock in one of these mega caps and you're not selling, that it's almost like from the point of view of, of estate planning, you're being very foolish. I, I, any one of these people should be selling. Uh, but when I look at they all have such faith. I mean, they just have faith in their companies, but they should be selling some because the movement in the mega caps versus everything else it is so extraordinary that it's a good time to be able to raise some money. Right. People aren't going to, you know, you raise money when you can, when you can sell, when the stocks are really screaming. Don't raise money when the stocks are going down. Right. Uh, Microsoft, speaking of which, oh, uh, gets up to 500 uh, from Dan, 475 Dan at Webb Bush. Dan but he's talking about what he calls a transformational co-pilot monetization. Well, Microsoft was very much in evidence uh, last week at the GTC conference for uh, NVIDIA. They have a lot going. Uh, I also think that it's interesting that the new PC that's AI is being branded a Microsoft PC, not an HP, not a Dell, but a Microsoft. And they're going to be able to put a button on, which lets you go to AI. Yep. I was on this morning, I was on ChatGPT, and I, I do prefer Claude 3 because Claude, which is uh, Anthropic, which has got four million, it's, there's a lot of money that's four billion that Amazon. Yep. Anthropic is much more conversational. ChatGPT is much more stilted. Uh, I always like if you hit if you hit me up in Claude Claude three, it's hysterical. Really, it's interesting yeah. that we're beginning to parse d different products Claude now. Claude three is Dino Mike. Now remember, if you can read Moby Dick in less than a second, yes. uh, you can know that if you do Claude three, Claude three is the one that's ado adopting the Blackwell, I think, faster than anyone, which is this new supercomputer uh, that's converse. It's much more conversational, which I think is really going to make it so people just say, you know what? I'd rather talk to this is the existential threat of Google, which I think the Justice Department start, should start realizing. I'd rather go to Claude 3 and have an intelligent conversation, as I did this morning. I tried to find out more about the MasterCard Visa yep, interchange. Yep. I'd rather have a conversation with Claude 3 than I would have a search query with Google. So you're using it with that kind of frequency? Oh, yeah. you got to use it. Like for example, what, what question would you pose on, well, on MasterCard I, I Visa? Pose is, uh, on the MasterCard Visa, I pose that... Uh, is this the case that's been kicking around since 2005? And explain to me what the uh, the consequences could be. Uh, and they talked about how they didn't mention the $30 billion figure because that's a Joseph Stiglitz figure. But they gave me more background than I would if I went to Google. It's really interesting. I'm not using Google nearly as much. Really? As I'm, oh, no, you I just, I mean, like, you know, go talk to my 29-year-old. And she says, who was like, I had to stop her from Googling her homework, you know? She's dead. Google? Please. <laughs> Google, huh, really? So I, uh, She's friendly with Claude 3. Does that lead you to think about Alphabet, or at least the search business, in a different way? Yes, or? it does. Uh, I am trying to figure out. I wanted to sell Alphabet for my travel trust. Uh, Jeff uh, Marks, who's my partner, said, listen, Jim, I think we've got to give it some time. That Apple deal better happen that Bloomberg broke, yep. because I would like to get rid of Alphabet, if only just because uh, Anthropic is so powerful. Claude 3 is so conversational. It's what, what people would call pros, P-R-O-S-E, pros. It's not uh, bulletin board. It's not uh, PowerPoint. It's pros. And I think that once that we get the new computer in from NVIDIA, you're just going to be, and you can talk, you're going to say, look, uh, Claude 3, could you please tell me a little more about what Larry Fink said this morning? Mm -hmm. uh, please summarize Larry Fink's letter for me. And it's going to come back with such a brilliant summary that you're going to say, why did it, I, I, I didn't have time to read the whole letter, but this is perfect. So were suspicions about, I mean, I don't want to talk about it in the past tense, but were suspicions about Google being behind the eight ball well-founded? Yes. Because the shares have looked past it. Well, they got to maybe have the Apple deal, but that, those are people who have not discovered uh, Claude 3, there's a great video about Anthropic and Amazon 
uh, with Adam Slipsky, whom I had on from Amazon Web Services, and you'll realize that the leapfrog here is extraordinary. Uh, so I am worried about Google. It's very funny because if you read the Justice Department's case against Google, uh, since they filed it, you have TikTok, which is number one. Uh, it doesn't do any anything with Google. It's number one uh, value, so to speak, of advertising. And now uh, ChatGPT and uh, and Claude make it so that you really got to think twice about going to search. Wow. Um, somewhat in that realm of, uh, of mega cap tech names, Jim, my, uh, Netflix today, B of A takes it off the U.S. one list yeah, and I think replaces just, it with Spotify. They're looking for to put Spotify. Spotify had a really dynamite quarter, but Netflix is, whenever you make a have a conversation about Disney, it's always like, why couldn't they be more like Netflix? And the answer is, because Netflix is what we would call, um, I would say it's streaming native. Just like uh, something's cloud native, like a crowd strike is cloud native when it comes to cybersecurity. This is streaming negative as a much better uh, view of what can be done. Uh, everyone else is just playing catch up. This is some tape today. We have a lot of stocks. You know, everything that's come public in the last few, in the, it, since the opening of the window is really extraordinary. And the one that we didn't talk about enough was ARM. I cannot believe that that window could open. Everyone, including <laughs> me, line, thought yes. that ARM would be hammered, and ARM is just too close and positive to NVIDIA. The NVIDIA conference lives on. Jensen lives on. <laughs> Jensen. Um, yeah, we didn't even really mention Seagate. Uh, Morgan Stanley goes to overweight 115. That implies 30% upside. Well, That's a big data center. There, Seagate is the... Is the uh, analog, frankly, comparison for Micron. Now, Micron's been going up endlessly ever since Micron put up that good number. And, you know, Sanjay Morota, I tried to get a hold of him. He was you know, traveling, but you know, Seagate is the hard drive, and Micron's the, you know, kind of the floppiest way you have to look at it. Like, in your brain, when you're trying to recall something, some things should be at the top of your head, and then secondly, like, you're trying to think, oh, it's in the back of my head. The back of your head is your disk drive. The front of your head is your Micron, okay? So this is Seagate, and this is Micron. When you're <laughs> trying like to recall bio things. Like, let's say you were trying to recall whether you gave Gambled on games. Oh, check that. Um, <laughs> the, the, trying, to, trying to recall when home opening day. Yes, is. yes. It may not be here. It might be back here. <laughs> um, Krispy Kreme, Jim. We mentioned uh -huh. it earlier, but this partnership with McDonald's uh, expanding. Uh, the company says it's going to double their points of access. Well, I, I, I have to tell you that Krispy Kreme has been um, a rocky road. But this was an endorsement that I think very few people saw coming. Uh, McDonald's downgraded yesterday. It hurt the stock. It was the weakest stock in the Dow. Uh, very, very positive for Krispy Kreme. Again, I just find that that stock should go. Oh, it's up two bucks. If things keep coming from left field that are positive, and we just don't expect them. And, and people are excited about the market. And I share their excitement. I share the excitement of this market. And, and you notice what we're not talking about much today. Rate cuts, Fed speed. What is that? Eco data. Enough already with that. Do you think the younger people want to hear that? The younger people want to discover how to make money. And they're looking, well, they're looking on Reddit for how to make money. Well, stop looking on Reddit and start buying on Reddit. <laughs> Look at this Reddit. They priced that. My Steve Huffman, who is not necessarily saluted by a lot of Redditors because he's got the ads all over yep. the place. I thought he did so great on your show. He was a champion champion for making money good for him yeah it's after so many interviews about are you going to go public are you going to go public finally be able to I say thought we wore him down and yeah. he didn't he still had to go he still had to go take a look at reddit and it's short public life meantime uh, jim's right market hanging in there 52 30 every sector green except for energy slightly red and then we'll watch bonds today there's some data we got durables uh, we got philly fed down 18 that was the worst since last spring coming up in about 12 minutes conference board richmond fed as well be right back
now. Coming up in the next hour, an exclusive with Morgan Stanley's chairman and Disney board member James Gorman. We'll talk about what he has to say about the Magic Kingdom's proxy fight against Nelson Peltz. First, though, Stop Trading with Jim's coming up after the break. It's time for Jim and Stop Trading. One stock that's not participating is Adobe, and that's because Canva, which is an incredible company in terms of a very inexpensive way to be able to do design, bought another company called Serif, which is just a, another excellent designing company. That younger people can't afford the Adobe Suite. I, I gave my daughter the Adobe Suite. It's about 600 bucks. It's fantastic. And she learned how to do it at Parsons. So she was taught, and it's incredible, and she was amazing just amazing but the way that people who are not uh, don't have the suite is they're going to canva and now they can go to serve part of canva and this is maybe existential for adobe but this wasn't this the whole reason behind figma right exactly exactly right and i don't know what i would do if i was chancing in orion who has spent so much time with younger people people feel they have to cut the price of the suite but the suite's extraordinarily good you do need to be taught on it though if you're taught on it, you can do anything. That's how amazing it is. But if you can't, then you go to Canva yeah. because it's very inexpensive. Uh, we'll watch that as well. So tonight, Larry Fink. Larry Fink, and it's a very soul, uh, 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 it's very soul searching in a way that I didn't expect Larry to be, but not morose. More of a like, we gotta help Jim. We gotta help get this done. Everybody, all our jobs to get it done. Very exciting too though. Yeah. I look forward to that, Jim. And of course, maybe we'll hear from him on earnings in yeah. not too long. And I'm going to be looking forward to your show. Yeah. Holy cow, Gorman? <laughs> oh, <laughs> my. And if he tries to dodge you, you tell him that I'm coming on, okay? <laughs> we got, got Jim like Marshall McLuhan in the corner right here. Oh, oh, my God. You <laughs> betcha. You betcha. Uh, right here. Jim's right. An exclusive with James Gorman, uh, Morgan Stanley chair and Disney board member. And of course, we'll stay on top of Trump media. Don't go anywhere.
Good Tuesday morning. Welcome to another hour of Squawk on the Street. I'm Sarah Eisen with Carl Quintanilla and Wilfred Frost all week long. We're live at Post 9 of the New York Stock Exchange. David has the morning off. Take a look at stocks this morning. A little bit of strength in the early action. The S&P up about a third of 1%. The Dow is unchanged. Remember, this is the last week of the quarter, and it certainly has been another strong one for stocks. So you might see some action on rebalancing and the like. Take a look at Treasuries as well. Better quarter for stocks than it was for bonds, and bonds are selling off again, mostly. Ten-year note yield up at 4.261. Got some data this hour as well. The two-year at 4.6 percent. We're 30 minutes here into the trading session. Here are three big movers we're watching. Former President Donald Trump's newly merged social media company has begun trading, and shares are soaring. Trump Media and Technology Group owns the Truth Social app platform and is trading on the NASDAQ under ticker DJT. We're going to have much more on that ahead on the show. Look at the stock up 45 percent. Shares of Viking Therapeutics up double digits. The biotech company reporting positive results from an early study of an oral form of its proposed obesity drugs. We've been following this one. Another big boost for that stock. And shares of Krispy Kreme rallying on news. McDonald's is planning to sell Krispy Kreme donuts at its restaurants nationwide by the end of 2026. The rollout will start in the second half of the year and will double Krispy Kreme's distribution. What took so long on that? <laughs> Sarah mentions the date of the sour. Let's get to Rick Santelli for that. Hey, Rick. Yes, hi, Carl. Uh, consumer confidence. This version from the conference board, these are March numbers. Expecting a headline of 107, a bit of a disappointment, 104.7. 104.7, that follows 106.7. 104.7 will be the lightest read going back to, uh, looks like November of last year. And if we look at the present situation, 151.0, a nice, nice jump from its previous read of 147.2. 151.0 would be the second best number of the year. January was 154.9, and that was the best going all the way back to July of 21. Expectations, what may lie ahead? 73.8, but in the rear view mirror, 79.8. So 73.8 is the lightest going back to May of last year. If we look at the Richmond Fed, and I like to look at these regional indices, on the manufacturing side, minus 11, that's double what we expected. Uh, and do keep in mind, these are the fifth negative read in a row. Minus 11 will be the second worst of the year from minus 15. And if we look at the services side, not much better. Minus 8, which means that we now have to go all the way back to August of last year to find a number greater than 0. Minus 8 would compare to the weakest level since November of last year when it was minus 9. How does all that sift through? Well, we see that 10 year, as Sarah pointed out, was at 426 before the number. It's been moving one basis point lower on these data points at four and a quarter, which is still uh, basically unchanged. But since we have a record size five year today at one Eastern, tw uh, 67 billion, I would like to point out that the five year note right now is trading 4.24%. That's up one basis point. Sarah, back to you. Thank you. We'll watch the auction. Look for you on results. Rick Santelli. And just on the consumer, Rick just noted the, the miss on consumer confidence. We're wondering where the consumer is as we go through the rest of the year and how strong the consumer remains. We did get some good color from McCormick, the spice maker, which reported today. Stocks up, profit better. Again, volumes down, pricing is helping. And here's what the CEO is saying about the consumer. Consumers remain challenged. Two years of steep inflation has had an impact, and many are exhibiting value-seeking behavior. While food inflation is slowing, its compounded impact is still being felt by consumers. Budgets are stretched, resulting in choiceful spending decisions, a trend that is continuing from the fourth quarter. In the first quarter, with higher inflation in the food service channel and slowing retail food prices, we broadly saw a shift from food away from home to food at home consumption in our major markets. I thought it was a really good piece of sound as, uh, as a descriptor of what the consumer is feeling right now and, and link it specifically to the consumer confidence number we just got and consumer confidence overall and maybe some polling numbers which shows that while food inflation is coming down, 
the compounding impact is still hurting the consumer. They're being choiceful. That was the word they used. Value oriented has been a really big word this this earning season. And people now making the choice, as we talked about yesterday, to eat less out of the home and more cooking in the home benefits companies like this, but also shows you that this has been a heavy weight and a burden for consumers. I also just wonder the extent to which, which he kind of mentioned there, there's a lag effect to food price inflation taking its toll on the consumer because of excess savings that might now be burned down. The other thing which maybe we'll talk a, a little bit with David Costin is that debate now whether good news, if we get some more of it in the economy, will be good or bad for markets. And, and on that topic, wage inflation data, do we want real wage inflation? Will that help consumers take take account for food price inflation, or do we not want it because it feeds into rate cut debate? Let's I think see. I know Sarah's answer. What, which you generally <laughs> see wage inflation as being net inflationary. Yeah. Well, that's that's how the Fed would see it, yeah. and that's typically what a wage price spiral is. I think it's good that Americans have finally real wage power, and and they want that spending power, and that's and we and we need that. But it does make you wonder about inflation. And by the way, food inflation is not coming down everywhere. Hope you're not planning to buy chocolate anytime oh soon. Well, Cocoa what, prices. Easter? It's well, not good timing. It's not good timing. <laughs> this is check out cocoa prices. They surpassed ten thousand dollars per metric ton. We have not seen anything like this. It's been a, a parabolic move on supply crunch issues in West Africa. 70% of the world's cocoa comes from West Africa. They've had drought. They've had bad weather. They've had disease. They've, this is the third year in a row there's a supply deficit there. And we've talked about this with Hershey's and Mondelez, obviously huge cocoa buyers about passing it on to the consumer or absorbing. Hershey's had flat earnings growth because of it in the last quarter. Hershey's and Mondelez were old closing bell favorites. Well, they, We've what, got another one coming up today as well. James Gorman? Yeah. yeah. In, bo Different in both topics. of our beats, yeah. yeah. Although it'd be funny if we threw a Coco question at him. He could probably answer it. Yeah. yeah. James, what? what well, what I also wonder whether he'll be a bit freer as well now. I mean, I guess he's still chairman of Morgan Stanley, but uh, I, I know we're mainly focusing on the, on the Disney stuff. But uh, anyway, lots, lots always to ask. No, it'll be a good reunion for you too. Yeah. I'm, ex I'm excited for that. The other, the other sort of topic du jour right now is debt, and this note, this quote actually stood out to me, Wilfred, in part because you're here, but we heard from Phil Swagel. He gave an interview to the Financial Times. He's the head of the Congressional Budget Office, nonpartisan commission that determines the debt and growth trajectories. Mm -hmm. And here's the quote that I pulled out of that interview, warning about ballooning U.S. debt. Danger is what the U.K. faced with former Prime Minister Liz Trust, where policymakers tried to take an action and then there's a market reaction to that action this is classic bond vigilante stuff the u.s he said is not there yet but he did put it out there so you can refresh our memory about how how well, lovely that period so, so, was so the really clearly there's a massive difference which was this was a, a government that rushed to make all sorts of uh, unfunded tax cuts at a time that they couldn't be afforded and clearly the supply demand dyma dynamics of the bond market fell out of bed yield soared that's not what we're talking about potentially here in the U.S. It's just a steady, slow increase of supply as opposed to a government action to suddenly cut taxes. But it is a really interesting question over the next two or three years. And this is the statistic that stands out for me. So debt to GDP here uh, is 120 percent, roughly speaking. In the U.K., it's a bit lower at 100 percent. And both countries obviously look great compared to Japan and over 200 percent. But over the next three years, in the U.S., 38 percent of the debt stock is coming up for renewal. It's, it's a huge percentage, and it's one of the few metrics the UK actually looks quite good at, or about half of that. Uh, Germany's worse at 43%, France and Japan in between at about 30%. And that's the big question. There's a lot of supply coming on, yields are elevated. Um, will there be a Enough more, more of a steady move towards uh, supply and demand imbalance as opposed to all of a sudden as it was with the Liz Truss episode? But I think that is the big remaining question as to whether this extraordinary outperformance of the US economy uh, relative to the developed world over the last couple of years will we'll continue. It's just hard for any politician to prioritize or do anything when there's no urgency coming from the markets. And there's not. The, demands have, the demand for the latest auctions have been very strong. Well, we're getting C-pluses from Rick Santelli. It's not A-pluses. <laughs> so, you know, we'll see what there happens. There hasn't been a major demand problem. There were some wobbles last year, but this year le less so. I think Larry Fink also is worth a read today in his big State of the Union. He talks mm -hmm. about this and he says, Carl, it's growth that's going to get us out of this. Policymakers should prioritize growth because that is a way out versus, say, cutting, spending, or raising taxes, which are just difficult and, and politically and also to make a dent in a major way. 
Uh, you'll hear more from Larry tonight on Mad Money, uh, speaking about his letter, which is a great read. Everybody should take a look. It is the last trading week of the first quarter. As Sarah said earlier, s and is on track for its best Q1 since 2019, up almost 10% so far this year. Our next guest is sticking with his year-end target of 5,200, but can see a scenario where the mega cap tech names do push the S&P up another 15%. Joining us here at Post 9 is Goldman Sachs Chief U.S. Equity Strategist David Costin, who's that six-handle made a splash earlier in the week, David. Are you prioritizing what's most likely here on these different scenarios? Carl, what's most likely is the market's flat from here to the end of the year, 5,200. That's target. It's expectation that you have modest growth in earnings, about 8%, looking into this year and 5% into or 6% into calendar 2025. That's the trajectory of profits. And the valuation, it's really important to break it into two pieces, to think about that equated index, SPW trading at 17 times earnings, which is expensive, almost the 90th percentile, and the premium that the aggregate S&P SPX index trades relative to the equal weight index. That trades at uh, at 21 times, it's kind of aggregate, about a 25 percent premium, 17 right. to uh, to 25. That dynamic suggests the market is likely to be closer to around 5,200. That is our baseline. Now, we created or thought about some different scenarios, a catch-up, a catch-down scenario. You could be, you know, pretty broad ranges, you know, 4,500 on the lower end, and 6,000 would be on the, uh, the upper end, to your, uh, to your question earlier. And that would be a scenario that you have the large-cap exceptionalism, mega-cap exceptionalism. Those stocks <clears throat> have a uh, multiple increase. That's less probable in our view. Maybe it's a little bit higher. You get some catch-up. Maybe it's uh, not 5,200, perhaps 5,800 would be a optimistic scenario, Carl. But I think our general forecast, our framework, what's priced in the market is 5,200. Are you moving your S&P earnings number? No. no. Yeah, right on line with uh, our expectation. Our forecast of around plus 8%, $241 a share. The consensus of the other strategists in the, in the street a little bit lower than that, and the bottom up of all the analysts uh, roughly in line with that. So bottom line, just think of high single digit kind of earnings growth, and that is pretty much the expectation. If you stand back, you got a couple of four things. You got the economy, you got earnings, you have valuation, you have money flow. What is priced into the market? The equity market today prices as though the U.S. economy is growing at 4%. It's not growing at 4%, but equity investors are pricing such. You can look at cyclical stocks relative to defensive stocks. That's the economy. The earnings, as I indicated, high single digit, basically pretty optimistic. Margins, a little bit higher. Sales growing, basically, that's a positive scenario in the backdrop. Valuations high, as we just talked about, not the highest, but it's pretty extended. And the money flow. Where's the money flow coming? It's coming from corporate repurchases. It's coming from households putting a little more, more money into equities. There's net selling on the part of pension funds, on mutual funds. Uh, th those are the, the stories. Do you have that's a, the framework. David, do you have a direct negative correlation between uh, where interest rates are, the Fed rate fund rates, and your S&P target? If we get more cuts, does your target increase? Or actually, we learned in the last couple of years that where the Fed funds rate isn't the key factor. Well, Alfred, it's an, it's an excellent point, because when the market was pricing, you know, was three cuts was priced into the market sort of last uh, fall, and then it kind of moved all the way to six cuts, again, forward market pricing, the smaller cap stocks rallied dramatically. And that's this idea of the equal weighted index, if you will, having a catch up. So to the extent that there is more cuts than is currently expected right now, that would be a positive mm -hmm. for a broadening of the market. To the extent that there are fewer cuts, Goldman Sachs economists expect three, forward market pricing mm -hmm. roughly around that level. If it was two, then that would be more supportive of larger cap, better balance sheets, more, you know, the, the mega cap mm -hmm. stocks continue to do better. So that's kind of how I think about your question. So I, I was going to say, uh, inflation is going to be a key question mark, right? I know you're not necessarily forecasting. Jan's been in the soft landing camp. But if we continue to get firmer inflation readings and that changes the Fed's trajectory, then do you revisit your S&P target? Well, the expectation right now is that the Fed is given the dots and uh, Goldman economists are looking for basically three cuts, one in June, one in September, one in December. And that would be consistent, again, with our forecast around 5,200. All of this information is priced into the market today, which is a good thing. It's not, not terrible. It's You're just, just taking the year sure. off, David. Well, it's the end of the first quarter, so we still have, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we still have another nine months to go. But yeah, the market's moved 25% last year. It's up 10% this year, and that's, uh, that's a lot of good news has been priced in today. There are obviously some scenarios that one could uh, think about for, for the coming year, but broadly, our assumptions are we're priced there for today. Uh, it's a good yeah. way to think about where we are. Look forward to 
touching base as we get earnings rolling in too in a couple of weeks. Okay. Good to see you, David. Thank you. Thank you. David Carson. We've got lots more still to come here on Squawk on the Street. Uh, after the break, we'll head live to Baltimore for the very latest on that major bridge collapse following a ship collision. Tesla has been cutting prices in some markets in the face of fierce competition from rivals. Elon Musk now taking some steps to jumpstart sales, but it could slow down the delivery process. And a big exclusive coming up with Morgan Stanley chairman and new Disney board member James Gorman. He spoke to us late last year before he joined Disney about the face off with Nelson Peltz. Remember this? I've had a lot of battles in my life. That doesn't bother me one little bit. We're going to talk to Gorman about Disney's proxy battle with Peltz and what comes next. Squawk on the Street will be right back. Don't go anywhere. Download the app. Former President Donald Trump's media company has begun trading and shares are rallying today. Trump Media, which owns the Truth Social app platform, one of the top 10 most active stocks on the NASDAQ today. Trump owns at least 58% of the company. We'll get a lot more on that story later on this hour. Well, turning to the breaking news overnight, a major bridge in Baltimore has collapsed after being struck by a cargo ship. Eamon Javis has the latest for us uh, from the scene. Eamon. Wilf, that's right. Officials here just wrapping up a press conference over the past couple of minutes and giving us new details now on the terrifying moments just before the bridge collapsed at about 1.30 a.m. this morning in the dark of night. Officials saying that the crew of the ship, this nearly 1,000-foot-long commercial vessel, the Dolly, a Singapore flag vessel, were able to issue a mayday call just before the impact, and they were able to transmit information to officials uh, here at the Port of Baltimore that uh, they had lost propulsion. And that was enough notice, Governor Wes Moore said uh, just moments ago, for crews on either side of the bridge to block traffic. Whatever early morning traffic was already mo moving, they said they were able to stop cars from getting onto the bridge. And that may have saved quite a few lives as uh, there were not 
a lot of vehicles on the bridge at the moment it went down. Tragically, though, there was a construction crew on the bridge at the time that it collapsed. The construction crew uh, was simply filling potholes on the overnight shift. They say there were eight people who were on the bridge when it went down. Six of those are still being looked for. Search and rescue crews, they say, are on the scene and continue uh, to search for those victims. No word yet on the fate of those six. Two others were rescued. One has been hospitalized. One was remarkably able to walk away on his own power uh, in the wake of this disaster. So uh, a, a real brush there for that individual, but six still unaccounted for, and they are continuing to look. I asked uh, Governor Wes Moore of Maryland just moments ago what his prognosis is for reopening shipping here at the Port of Baltimore, if he has any early indication of how long commerce is going to be stopped at this major East Coast port. He said it's simply too early to say that right now. He said their focus is on search and rescue at this minute. Uh, but he did also say, uh, guys, that he was able to rule out at least one potential factor here uh, in causing this incident. Take a listen to the governor of Maryland just a few moments ago. We are still investigating what happened, but we are quickly gathering details. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. So at this point, this just seen as a tragic accident here at the port of Baltimore. But as you guys know, such a major hub for commerce and business up and down the East Coast, major port here for automobiles, the largest port uh, on the East Coast for automobile arrivals uh, in the United States, more than 800,000 cars and light trucks arrived at this port in 2023, uh, the 13th year that it was a, a leading uh, port for automobiles uh, here on the East Coast. So it gives you a sense of the scale of the economic impact uh, that we're now going to start to see. Uh, the governor said at this point it's going to be an all of society effort uh, to get this bridge uh, out of the water and to reconstruct. He said they're going to reconstruct uh, better than before and he said they're going to reconstruct in a way that preserves the memory of those who have been impacted. Too early to say uh, what the ultimate casualty count here will be because salt and, uh, search and rescue is still going on. But uh, at this point, uh, they are saying that they are going to rebuild here in Maryland. Back over to you guys. All right, Eamon. Keep us posted. Pretty terrible. Thank you very much, you Eamon Javers. We're going to continue to monitor that story for you. Still to come, Tesla gaining today but firmly in bear market territory on the year. As one former executive warns, don't forget about China. What investors need to know after the break. Plus, big interview. Still ahead, an exclusive with Morgan Stanley Executive Chairman and Disney Board member James Gorman. Stay with us. Back in two minutes.
Check out shares of Visa and MasterCard today. The credit card company settling a class action lawsuit over fees they charge merchants. They've agreed to lower the rates and have agreed not to raise those rates for at least five years. Settlement resolves claims going back a couple of decades when a group of retailers filed a class action suit claiming that Visa and MasterCard's fees and network rules violated U.S. antitrust laws. Tesla higher today despite Wall Street losing its drive for EVs. The company now offering U.S. customers a month free trial of its uh, driver assist technology. Longtime bull Bernstein's uh, Tony Sakanagi splashing his price, slashing his price target, excuse me, from 150 to 120 bucks per share, forecasting a 30 percent drop in the stock over the next 12 months. Well, joining us now, DVX Ventures CEO John McNeil. Uh, John was present at Tesla, overseeing global sales as well as delivery and services, uh, and now sits on the board of uh, GM. Uh, very good to see you, John. Thanks for joining us. Nice to see you. Um, I, I was interested, big picture, first of all, on the kind of sales tactics we've seen out of Tesla in the last year or two, particularly when it's sort of quite high profile tweets from the CEO uh, to say, we're going to cut the price, it's coming soon. And, and whether that is only ever going to be a successful sales strategy in the short term and sort of undermines the pricing power that perhaps Tesla previously had in the long term. I think it not only undermines the pricing power, but it also depreciates cars that people have already bought. Uh, and that's, I think, a bigger issue. If, you've, if, you purchased, if you purchase a Tesla and the price keeps dropping and the value of your car keeps dropping, it could be below your loan. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means people are upside down in their loans. And that means they're probably not going to buy a second car. Uh, from that manufacturer. So you've got to be really careful in this industry around long-term pricing strategy and predictability for consumers. So do you, do you see this as real sign of desperation or just short-sighted tactics or, or what? I think this is, as they've said, this is to keep their factories humming. Uh, and so uh, when production slows down in a factory, uh, it can really affect your margins. And so I think the main goal here is for them to keep their factories busy. Um, what is the biggest source of competition now for Tesla, but, but more broadly, the U.S. automakers, but the U.S. EV parts of the automakers. Is it, is it the Chinese players? I mean, the quality of European EVs is, is really caught up from, from the traditional German names. I think that's right. I think it's all of the above. So BYD is, is maybe the biggest competitor in the world. They've become the largest producer of EVs, uh, and they're out of China. Uh, but in, here in the U.S., we've got now a wave of cars coming to market uh, this year. They're very affordable. So you've got cars like the Chevy Bolt that are less than $20,000 after the incentive, and the Chevy Equinox that's less than thirty, dollars which is a SUV with more than 300 miles of range. But still can't compete with those Chinese EVs a, in terms of price. On a price point, that's exactly right, because there's a bunch of incentives and subsidies that, uh, that, are, that the Chinese government helps their manufacturers with. Uh, and so that's an issue for all manufacturers outside of China to deal with, and policymakers. Is GM rethinking the EV future? that Mary Barra talked about, given what we've seen from the consumer and from competition? I think, you know, Goldman just published a study that more than almost 60 percent of consumers for their next car are considering an EV. We sold 1.2 million EVs in the U.S. last year. That's a $65 billion market already uh, for EVs, and it continues to grow. I think we're going to have a rough first quarter in terms of sales data because a lot of the cars didn't qualify for the tax incentive. But that's now worked itself out, and I think we'll, can, we'll return to growth uh, second through fourth quarters of this year. You mentioned the weak residual value of a, a Tesla. Is that because of repair costs or, or, uh, or just friction in finding a buyer for a used car? It's mainly because the, the sale prices have come down. So if I paid $90,000 for a Model S three years ago, that car now sells for $70,000. And so that's the biggest driver of the decline in residual values. Uh, the repair costs are actually uh, quite a bit less. Like I drive a couple of EVs. I haven't been to the repair shop in a couple of years <laughs> because the, the, uh, an EV motor has only one part. So there's not a lot <laughs> yeah. to break right. uh, in that car. John McNeil, really interesting. Thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Thanks for having me. Still to come, an exclusive interview with Morgan Stanley, executive chairman and newest Disney board member, James Gorman. He spoke to us back in December before he joined Disney about his experience with activists like Nelson Peltz. The sorts of things I've done in this job is strategic transformation, uh, obviously dealt with shareholders at many levels, including activists, um, succession talent building. So some of the challenges that I have, I hope, you know, <clears throat> I can lend some of my experience on it. We will, we will talk to Gorman about Disney's proxy battle and what comes next right after a break. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to Squawk on the Street. I'm Bertha Coombs with your CNBC News update. The Supreme Court is hearing a challenge this morning to the Food and Drug Administration's decisions to increase access to the abortion drug Mifeprestone. A Texas-based district judge invalidated some of the FDA's actions from 2016 onward, which include making it available by mail and extending the window in which it can be used from 7 to 10 weeks. Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich will have to spend at least three more months in detention in Russia. A judge ordered him to be held until June on espionage charges that his publication and the U.S. government strongly deny. Friday will mark one year since Gerskovich's arrest. Russian President Vladimir Putin has signaled that he may be open to a prisoner exchange for the journalist. And WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's extradition to the United States has been delayed. A London court gave the U.S. three weeks to provide assurances around Assange's First Amendment rights, including that he would not receive the death penalty if convicted. If that does not happen, he can appeal extradition in May. Sarah, back over to you. Okay, Bertha, thank you. We are nearly a week away here from Disney's annual meeting where Nelson Peltz, Tryon, is fighting for two seats on the Disney board. Proxy advisory firm ISS siding with Peltz with a focus on the company's failed succession planning, saying, in part, quote, the question for shareholders is not whether the CEO should be replaced, but whether the board, having failed to properly oversee the last succession process, is capable of avoiding the same mistakes. Joining us now with some perspective is Morgan Stanley, executive chairman and newest Disney board member, James Gorman. Welcome back, James. Good to see you. Hey, Sarah. I thought I'd retired from this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're as relevant as ever here uh, on the Disney board. Why are you guys fighting Tryon so hard against joining the board? I don't think it's fighting Tryon so hard. I think it's just trying to lead this company, which uh, Bob and board chair uh, Mark Parker are doing, uh, for the next uh, many years as they turn around what has been obviously a more challenging period through COVID. So, you know, the focus is on what's right for Disney at this point in time. But the argument, and, and we can get to succession in a moment, really centers around the underperformance of Disney's stock against the S&P, against its, its competitors, with most of the current board. I know you are, you are the newest member, but the rest of the current board has been there. Well, I think that's pretty backward looking. I mean, uh, look at year to date. I think the stock's up 29, 30 percent year to date. So, you know, you got you got to see things through the fullness of time. Imagine taking a company that uh, its business is bringing people into parks, putting them on cruises, having them watch movies in movie theaters and going through a period like we went through with COVID. At the same time, there was a massive transformation going on in the linear to streaming businesses. So there was clearly a period of major disruption in this industry. And I think what Bob and the team are doing is obviously turning that around. It's evidenced by the performance in the stock. Well, the stock has also jumped since last October when it was revealed that Tryon was going to force a proxy fight. It's, it's debatable how much of the, of the stock performance has to do with that, James. But to your point, against the media peers, 70 percent of the profit in this company is, is parks. So why the underperformance? over the last, what, five, three, one year? Well, again, I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not going to talk about the history at Disney. What I'm focused on is the future and the plan for the future. And if you look at it, I think what Bob is doing with the focus on uh, the creative side and particularly um, uh, quality over volume, uh, what he's done for uh, shareholders, I mean, the dividend was increased 50 percent last year and there's a new buyback in place. Uh, what he's done in the transformation that's taking place at ESPN and the multi-year, multi-decade investment that's been put forward for parks and cruises. You know, it's incredibly exciting, the future. So I think a lot of this fight seems to be looking backwards. I'm more interested in why joining the board is looking forwards. Well, looking forward, they still have to deal with the succession issue, and that has been oh. one of the strongest cases for change because this board didn't get it right. ISS says the importance of executing a successful succession plan, particularly for a company of this complexity, and the board's prior failure to properly oversee this process suggests some level of change at the board level is warranted. Yeah, and Glass Lewis said exactly the opposite. Uh, oh. You know, you've, you've got to take the, these are judgment calls based on the facts, and you know, when I joined the board, the thing I was focused on was that they had a rigorous succession process. 
Uh, there's a new board chair as of last year, Mark Parker, obviously a phenomenal uh, executive in his own right at Nike. Uh, he's chair of the succession committee. That committee had met, I think, 17 days after I joined the board, and uh, it's due to meet another eight or nine times this year. Uh, there are external advisors working with the team. Honestly, I've been, you know, I just came through a huge succession process at Morgan Stanley. I'm impressed by the process. You now, ultimately, it's the judgment, you know, when the judgments are made at the end of the process that will matter. But you won't get there without a good process. And I'm impressed. It's very thorough, very disciplined. So you did just retire and, and went through this process, but you're now executive chair. And I do wonder if that's a good model, because that was one of the things that happened with Disney last time. So are we to assume that this next time around, executive chair Bob Iger will, will take that role again and that would be a good thing? I don't, th I don't think there's one model. I'm not going to speak and prejudge what the board, the succession committee will do. And I'll say, by the way, the whole board is leaning into this. Uh, again, forward-looking, forward-leaning, uh, an incredibly disciplined process. There are many examples of companies with uh, chair, CEO combined, which I did, executive chair and CEO, which I had for two years uh, with my predecessor, John Mack, uh, long-term executive chairs. There's no single answer. You have to do what's right for the particular needs of the company and the skill set embodied in the leadership of that company. James, it's Wilf. It's, it's great to see you. Um, I'm interested in, in the timing of, uh, of you becoming uh, a Disney board member because uh, from, from the outside where I was watching, I, I was surprised how quickly you took up another, another role, albeit, of course, a non-executive one. And, of course, you're still chairman of Morgan Stanley. And I, I just... Just wondered how this came about. When did they ask you? And are you a little surprised how quickly you took up this role? Were they desperate for you? No, definitely not. I mean, look at the quality of uh, people on this board. It's, I mean, somebody somebody described it the other day. It's like the Mount Rushmore of uh, boards. You've got, you know, executives like uh, Mary Barra. I mean, world class Calvin McDonald. You've got people from all walks of life and industry. And Jeremy Darrock, who just joined the board uh, from Skywolf, who I'm sure you know. Uh, an extraordinarily competent executive. He joined at the same time as I did. Um, honestly, I wasn't planning to go on a board. Uh, but, you know, like a lot of us, I grew up watching Disney. I, at home, my dad uh, let us watch one hour of TV a week. There were 10 of us, <laughs> so we could sit in there for one hour. And my show to watch on Sunday night at 6 o'clock was uh, Disney World. And, uh, you know, whether it's Frontierland or Tomorrowland, I still remember it very fondly. This is one of the great American companies. It's a part of everybody in this country and around the world. Uh, we've all been to the parks, on the cruises. We've all seen the shows. And I just thought it was an incredibly exciting thing to contribute to this board. And frankly, Bob Iger, you know, uh, Bob Iger has to go down as one of the greatest media executives in history. There's just no question about that if you look at what he's done. And look at what he's done in the last year. Uh, since mm -hmm. he's really got into stride here, coming back and turning this thing around. So, no, it's an honor and a privilege. I didn't expect it. I was honored they called, and I'll do my best to contribute. Well, you're definitely not going to get me uh, saying a bad word about Jeremy Darrock, uh, James, whilst, whilst we're chatting about this. Um, I, I'm interested. I went back and watched the interview you gave to, to Leslie Picker the day you announced that you were going to be transitioning yourself. And on succession planning, you said, I'm really into having plans, being intentional about this stuff, uh, you went on to say uh, that you wanted to do it and execute it in an elegant way. And I think uh, everyone uh, who knows the, the banking industry thinks you, you did execute that pretty, pretty successfully. Um, when you said that to Leslie, you said it with a, a wry and quite big smile on your face. And I just wonder whether you are having a, a little bit of a swipe at some of your banking rivals. Do, do you think that Jamie Dimon and uh, Brian Moynihan are holding on to power a little too long? No, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't judge others. I don't do strategy for envy and I don't judge other executives. And I, I said on that show that Jamie may be the best banking executive, uh, you know, that's been around. So, no, everybody has to do their own thing. Um, I honestly did not expect to stay as long as I did in the job. I wasn't planning to. But along came this nasty little virus called COVID, which, by the way, I just had my third time the other day. Uh, and it gets better as you go on, is my experience anyway. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it, it's um, no, I focus on what's right for the institutions I'm involved with. I was very focused and continue to be on what's right for Morgan Stanley. And we had a great succession process. I'll just say Ted Pick, by the way, 
uh, has been pitch perfect since he started. He's done a spectacular job in the first few months, and and I think the whole firm has rallied. Um, uh, I'm very excited. I'm standing in a new office. You can't see the rest of it. It's full of boxes. Uh, but that's what happens when you mm -hmm. step out of the CEO role. So uh, I'm thrilled for Ted. I'm thrilled for our company. And now I just want to contribute in other ways. Um, I'll be chair here probably through the end of this year, no longer, uh, for sure. And, um, you know, the, the company's in great shape. So I want to contribute in other ways. And, and again, you know, Disney was part of my childhood. It's part of American mm -hmm. culture. Uh, it deserves it deserves um, it deserves the best. It doesn't deserve acrimony. It deserves to move forward with the kinds of investments that Bob and the team have put in place. Well, you might not be surprised to know that Tryon has a statement uh, about your appearance today. They they believe, James, that Mr. Gorman is a welcome addition to the board. But Tryon says this proxy contest is not about your credentials. The Disney board needs a shareholder mindset. And they go on to talk about how candidates Nelson Peltz and Jay Rasulo would represent owners inside the boardroom and urge the board to finally do its job, overseeing the company's strategy, capital allocation, reviewing management, uh, execution of the plan, planning CEO succession, and aligning compensation with shareholder value. Why not have a shareholder activist on that board? I'm not going to get into uh, the whys and wherefores, and obviously I've known the folks at Tryon for a long time. Um, the question is, what's right for Disney at this point in time? And clearly there's a, you know, th there have been tensions out there. I'll just put that politely. Um, you know, there's enormous momentum. If you've got a capital plan uh, to invest $60 billion over 10 years, if you're dealing with the transformation that's going on in the linear to streaming, you've got these extraordinary assets like ESPN, uh, that are being reformulated, repurposed, if you will, for the next decade, there is an enormous amount going on. And having a cohesive board working together, but independently, remember, we're independent yeah. directors, that's very important. Have you engaged working at all? Working together but independently is critical. Have you engaged at all with either Peltz or Rasula? No, but that's not that's not my job. I'm, 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 I'm one of 12 directors, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm just happy to contribute. Listen, what we're trying to do is find... What's the best balance for shareholders at this point in time? The momentum we're under uh, versus other choices, and that's for shareholders to figure out. I'm not going to tell people what they do. They have to, they're being offered uh, different choices, mm -hmm. and they have to exercise what's in the best shareholders' interest. But mm -hmm. independence directors is to protect the best interests of shareholders, and I joined this board for exactly that purpose. Sure. James, a very quick final macro question, uh, if it's okay. And we were discussing this earlier, right. the sort of prospect of... Uh, uh, of the U.S. debt supply coming online in the next couple of years, um, uh, hurting market sentiment. Do you think there is a significant risk of de de dislocation in the U.S. Treasury market as supply comes on? I, I mean, well, if I thought I was, I thought I was out of that banking world. Um, <laughs> You're still chairman. You know, no, You're still not chairman. really. I'm more, I'm more focused on what the Fed's going to do this year, and I'll give you my two cents for what it's worth. I think I would not be surprised if they don't move uh, in the first half of this. Uh, I would be surprised if they move in the first half of this year. I would not be totally shocked if they don't do anything for the rest of the year. Um, I know the market's pricing now three rate increases versus six a couple of months ago. You know, the Fed has to ask, what's, what's the benefit? Um, and at the moment, the economy remains robust, as you're seeing. The S&P's, what, over 5,200? The jobs numbers are great. So that's, 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 the, only, that's the only economic uh, thing I'm... I'm not going to forecast doom and gloom for America. The people who have done that um, uh, have generally been unsuccessful, in my experience. Well, we, we always appreciate your market calls, James. I remember talking to you in the middle of the COVID crisis when you thought the stock market had bottomed, and that turned out to be a good one. James Gorman, thank you very much for taking the time today. Thanks, James. Sure. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Executive Chairman of Morgan Stanley and a board member of Disney, by the way, on the succession committee. Meantime, a big windfall for former President Trump as shares of his social media company surge in their first day of trade post back merger. Details on that after the break.
CNBC Pro. Welcome back. Former President uh, Donald Trump's social media company is opening for trade today under the ticker DJT on the Nasdaq and shares surging, uh, as you can see there. Let's get to Bob Pisani, who's here with us at Post 9 with more on this, Bob. So uh, talk us through the action early, early days. Well, it's not clear if this is a resurgence of the SPAC market, but it's certainly very good news for President Trump, former President Trump. Trump Media and Technology Group is the result of a merger between Trump's company and the shell company Digital World Acquisition. It's trading on the NASDAQ under the ticker DJT. By the way, you're not seeing things. This is the same ticker that was used by Trump Hotels and Casino Resorts, Trump's casino company that filed for bankruptcy and delisted from the New York Stock Exchange in 2004. Its market value before it began trading was roughly $6.8 billion. Again, that's before trading, making Trump's approximately 58% stake worth nearly $4 billion. Again, that's before trading. But under current rules, Trump is barred from selling shares for six months or borrowing cash against them. It is not clear if the board will make any special provisions to get around that. Today's SPAC is a very big one, but it is a reminder of the long, slow decline of the SPAC business. It started getting big in 2020, but really it exploded in 2021 with $162 billion, that's gross public proceeds, before collapsing, look at that, to around $13 billion in 2022 and only $2.8 billion last year. So three things led to this collapse of the SPAC business. One was the very poor aftermarket performance of SPACs. Russell Investments noted that the performance of companies taken public through SPAC mergers fell 45% in 2021 and 75% in 2022. The second thing was an increase in liquidations as many sponsors opted to return capital to investors because of the inability to complete deals within the required time frame. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the involvement of the SEC, which stepped in to propose stricter rules governing forward-looking statements and accounting disclosures. That scared the lawyers and the accountants, and SPAC issuance dropped dramatically after that. So I guess the question here, Wolf, is, is this some kind of SPAC resurgence? I think this may be a little bit of an anomaly. We're definitely seeing a little bit mm -hmm. of an IPO resurgence. Look at Reddit doubling. Astra's done really well. I think there's two problems, and I wish Faber was here because he was so good on this. The first is the That's Lucy a bit rude. I'm in to replace him the for the Lucy week. Goosey, <laughs> it's hard to replace, David, but, but you, are, you are definitely the one for it. The Lucy Goosey problem with the forward-looking <laughs> statements that were made by these companies. Remember the problem with some of these EV makers? They got into trouble because they were making forward-looking statements that they couldn't mm -hmm. back up. And, the, and Gensler stepped in to stop that. But the other big problem is the deal structure doesn't make a lot of sense. So think about this. I'm a famous oil executive. I want to float a SPAC. What are we going to do? I don't know, but I'm a famous oil executive. Trust me. And you had to sort of buy into the idea that this guy was famous, this mm -hmm. oil executive. But then they only had 18 to 24 months to complete the deal. A lot of them couldn't complete the deal. They had to return the money. That cost them all sorts of money because they had to put up all the upfront costs. Then people announced the deal and they looked at it and said, I don't like this deal. And most of them opted out of the deal. So the structure, there's a misalignment of interest. I wonder if it's a more there. vote in Trump in than it is in SPACs. Well, that's Bob. what I think is going on. That's why yeah. I'm not willing to say there's a sudden resurgence mm. in SPAC interest because of, of this. On I this, think you're right, Sarah. On this deal particularly, Bob, uh, any kind of hints at where it might trade in future based on the float, the size, the volumes today that when you, you've covered so many IPOs, what, what's your take on I, the numbers? We're again, I think this is a little bit of an anomaly because exactly what Sarah said. I'm much more interested in following the reopening of the IPO market, which because of particularly Astera Labs, uh, uh, there's a good sign for where the AI business is going, AI IPOs, that kind of thing gets me excited. And frankly, I'm surprised and delighted that Reddit has done so well. I would not have bet that Reddit's, Reddit's doubled today from its IPO price. That gets me kind of excited. And again, pleasantly surprised. Astera Labs, that's an AI home run right there. Uh, but I think that Reddit doing well is going to open up a lot of Excitement in the what, what is Truth market. Social's revenues like? Uh, five million. Yeah. In a year and a half, I think it's something like. And it's, it's, and very, it's valued very small. at now. Uh, well, <laughs> few billion the numbers here. Uh, Six point eight yeah, billion. Price, about, price to sales that. on that is going to be yeah. tough. Yeah. yeah. Very tough. The metrics are tough to argue with. Right. Bob, thanks. Yeah. Uh, meantime, CNBC's latest All America surveys out. Our Steve Leisman looking at what he calls an econ paradox in the numbers. Steve. Hey, Carl, thanks. Yeah, the economic paradox in the CNBC All-America Economic Survey, I think, is this. A plurality of Americans believe they're going to be better off if Donald Trump wins the presidency. Yet many of the personal financial measures we track on a routine basis 
So pretty good improvement in some cases back to the pre-pandemic level. Take a look here. 39% say they'll be better off if Trump wins. That's our, of 1,000 people. 23% if Biden wins. And 34% say it doesn't matter. I got to say, though, that the number is driven substantially by Republicans. If you take a look here, 42% of Democrats say it doesn't matter who wins. 51% of independents, but only 18% of Republicans. That is, they think it matters a whole lot for their personal financial well-being that Donald Trump is elected president. Still, 25% of independents say they're better off under Trump, more than double the percent who say Biden. All this, however, comes with some improvement in key economic measures. A net 33% say their home values will increase. That's the highest in two years. 37% say it's a good time to invest in stocks. That's the highest in three years. 37% expect their wages to increase. That's about average over the course of the poll. And 40%, I guess that's over my left shoulder here, say they expect a recession. That's the lowest since 2000. And when it comes to the stock market, 60% of those with the highest salaries and the most in the market, we call those the financial elite, say it's a good time to invest compared with 26 who say it's a bad time. An explanation to the paradox could be the inflation problem. Inflation is by far the biggest problem, uh, the top concern, more so than any other economic or social issue. Trump has a 22% a 22 point lead when voters are asked who is best on the issue. Biden has a, a lead when it comes to health care, Trump on the middle class and immigration, uh, Trump by 30 points. So we'll just leave it there, Carl. Um, I would say that it's a horse race out there. The uh, track is a little muddy underneath Biden when it comes to economic issues, but it's a little firmer. Trump, however, remains in the lead on economic issues. Carl? Yeah, pretty interesting, Steve, to see how that matches up with some of the older, other polls uh, today. Steve Leisman, thanks. But meantime, next hour, a whole lot more on the future of autos and EVs as the biggest auto show in the country kicks off here in New York City. We've got the CEO of Hyundai Global and the CEO of Mercedes-Benz when Money Movers begins after this.
Good Tuesday morning again. Welcome to Money Movers. I'm Sarah Eisen with Carl Quintanilla, live from Post 9 of the New York Stock Exchange. Hyundai's global COO and chief of North America joins us in just a moment, warning of slowing growth in 2024 and some macro uncertainty. Plus one fund manager with $103 billion in assets under management makes the case for emerging markets heading into the rest of the year. Later, Adam Newman makes a bid for WeWork, the latest on his $500 million plus bid, and what's behind his return? Meantime, watching stocks with some modest gains today, 52.33 is maybe 10 points shy of an all-time closing high. We'll keep an eye on that as we await uh, more corporate and eco data later on in the week. Major averages continue their march higher. S&P on pace for the best first quarter, as you know, since 2019. Is there anything that can break that market plan? claim? Let's bring in CNBC senior markets commentator Mike Santoli. Mike, a lot of comments on how seasonality this year has surprised some as well. Yeah, for sure. There hasn't been any real bout of turbulence. Sometimes you get it in February. It didn't happen this year. Um, and honestly, you can ar make an argument for uh, why you might see an air pocket going into uh, April. But here's the thing. All of the data you stack up that say when the market behaves the way it has behaved over the last several months, you basically come out with this is not an ultimate top. If it's not an ultimate top, maybe you can be comfortable that you could ride out any bumps. And the calm in the market, to me, starts with the bond market. It's been very low volatility. It's been very secure. A consensus that there's not a lot of macro flux. The soft no landing uh, scenario seems to have very, very tight embrace by everybody. So what could break the calm is exactly something that disturbs that outlook. A um, little bit of a ragged consumer confidence number in the internals in terms of people saying their own personal fin uh, for finances, present condition not looking so great. I don't put a lot of uh, weight on those things, but it sort of shows you you have parts of the market and the economy that look like there might be getting some fatigue, not enough to, to really uh, upend anything out there. I feel like something usually comes along when the market is overbought and overloved as it has been right now. We just have to wait for what that is. How about what James Gorman just told us, former yeah. CEO and executive chairman of Morgan Stanley? I wouldn't be surprised, he said, to see the Fed not do any rate cuts this year because the economy is in such good shape. I think it's a long shot. I also think we're all fixated on this idea that when they cut rates, it's because the economy needs to be rescued. And that's just not what the way they're thinking about things mm -hmm. right now. They're, they're kind of, they think it's pre-baked that unless something weird happens in terms of inflation flaring up, we're probably going to get these trims. Um, and really, maybe not a lot. Maybe it's going to be later uh, than we thought before. But I, I don't think that, I think the, the Fed needs to maybe make it more clear that the economy can be fine and we can be cutting. And I think the market is largely uh, kind of bought into that. It also, it's, it's kind of this theme we've heard among bankers, Carl, lately. David Solomon has warned that in inflation is going to be stickier than expected. Jamie Dimon has also sort of sounded that tune as well. Larry Fink, Fink too, has said it recently of BlackRock expecting higher inflation for longer. I'm going to make the job tougher for the Fed to cut. Right. Well, certainly, uh, deglobalization hurts that effort as well. Finally, Mike, Reddit, DJT, yeah. um, what do you think of, can we put a string together that argues that there's just extreme enthusiasm in pockets of the market? Yeah, I think you can. I think that when there is, you know, macro calm and everything seems secure and the rally's been rolling for five months, uh, people play. And I think that there's a lot of playing and there's a lot of channeling of uh, enthusiasm in idiosyncratic ways. Obviously, crypto got there first. And so I think that's kind of uh, led the way for a lot of this type of activity. Uh, it's not back to where it was, let's say, three plus years ago, but it, it definitely is percolating. Mike, we'll talk in a little bit. Thanks. Uh, Mike Santoli. As the major indices uh, keep hovering around these all time highs, our next guest says history suggests the year to date rally is poised to continue. He maintains his overweight positioning on equities in the U.S. more broadly. Joining us here at Post 9, Phil Camparelli is a portfolio manager for multi asset solutions at JP Morgan Asset Management. Phil, it's great to see you. Yep. I I'm interested in your building a portfolio that can withstand no yeah. cuts this year. Yeah. Yeah, and Carl, we were bracing ourselves coming into March because the last two years, it's been more than basketball that's been crazy in March, right? So 2022, you had the Fed say maybe we'll hike three times. By the end of that year, they were hiking four times in a row by 75 base points. Last year, the regional bank turmoil, it's the tip of the iceberg. It's going to take things down. It ended up being the tip of the ice cube, right? <laughs> so you turn to this year now, and, you know, Purdue got out of the first round, yeah, finally. Right. And, and I think Kentucky. equity markets, and I think equity markets are going to get out of this, too, right? So you have a Federal Reserve now that's saying we're going to upgrade growth materially. So they went from 1.4 to 2.1, okay, on growth. They upgraded inflation a little bit. 
um, and they still said they want to ease. And I think this is really important because we came into this year pricing in six or seven eases. We're now down to about three. We may not even get three. And, and stock markets are having a, a, a really a really good run. Do you think Bostic is a, a trial mm -hmm. balloon of sorts? And why didn't why did the chairman take the chance to maybe echo some of this one cut of, of this year? Yeah, so this is this is something, Carl, that we're really focused on. Less easing is so much less controversial than more tightening. And remember, last year, everyone had a consensus view of recession. Okay, 100% of economists almost were saying recession. This year, the very consensus view is easing. So like you said, we're trying to build a portfolio where if we don't get the easing, we can still withstand. So what does that mean? Companies Just a heads up, this morning we've got at 11.30 a 42-day bill auction. Shouldn't be a huge event. And then later on we have at 1 p.m. the five-year note auction. Uh, shouldn't be that big of an event either. At 4.30, though, there is an API crude oil stock change. Saying It's all priced in, all that good news, and the market's going to do nothing for the rest of the year. What, what do you see that's not priced in yet? So the earnings story isn't quite priced in. So multiples maybe, right? So even when we were coming into this year, Sarah, and we were saying the S&P 493 has room to run, right? The, those 490 stocks are trading at 20 times right now, or 19 and a half times. So I think it's the earnings story. And there's really important secular drivers behind this view. So population growth, the CBO is estimating 1% immigration. That might not sound by a lot. That's the most since 1910, if we get 1% immigration. The productivity story around AI, we'll see. That's more to come over the next few years. But the other two big secular themes, the 7% deficit, that's a lot of fiscal spend, and a $7 trillion Fed balance sheet. Before COVID, it was at four, it got to eight, and they're probably gonna stop around seven trillion. Sarah, these are all drivers of what we think is really good, real GDP growth that is gonna drive the earnings story. This year, next year? I mean, you're so talking this, about big, yeah. long-term themes here. Yes, but those, some of those drivers, including population growth, that's this year's story of a 1%. So you think estimates growth. are going higher? Yeah, so we think estimates are going higher, and then that allows the market to continue to, to, to move. So this above-trend growth story, the Fed just upgraded it last week. People are catching up to that now, and I think the growth story is going to continue to stay. Well, we just had this discussion as well with, with Costin about S&P earnings, right? Mm -hmm. What's consensus? 240 and change. Yep. Mm -hmm. Some have gone to 250. Are you yep. that aggressive? Yeah, so we're at about a 10% earnings growth forecast for this year. Yeah, and last year was negative one. Why? Because the S&P 493, that was so worried about rates, recession, inflation, were held back. So this year, I think there's going to be more of a share from those companies, Carl, and those MAG-7 don't need to do as much of the heavy lift. Do you think it was that fear of macro weakness mm -hmm. that led to efficiency gains, headcount reductions, investments lean. in the computer stack. That's right, and that's the lean story coming into this year where they don't need to, to worry about that. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, Carl, uh, the, the non-US story, so the Japan story. <laughs> I've never talked to you guys about an all-time high in the Japanese stock market, right? That was 34 years ago, and I've never talked to you guys about the Bank of Japan raising rates. Like, this is a normalization process. Japanese people just got their highest wage increase in 30 years. These, is, these are really important drivers that I think can broaden out the story from just picking the mega cap stock. Not too late on that trade? Not too late, Sarah. So I, we think that this has more room more room to run. Japan. And, yeah, yeah, Japan. And even, and even places like Europe, some of these secular themes like obesity drugs and the AI story. It's not just in the U.S. You can go find that outside of the U.S. as well. India is another one that people look yeah. into those sort of structural strong stories right now. Right. So they jump off the page over the next 10 to 12 years. So hopefully I can be back here in a decade talk about yeah. India. Uh, but we're not we're not focusing on EM as much today. We like to develop non-US stories. Good stuff, Phil. Thanks Great. for Casino. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil Camperly. Thanks, Phil. We are continuing to follow the bridge collapse in Baltimore after a cargo ship hit the structure early this morning. Our Eamon Jabbers is there with the latest. Eamon. Yes, yeah, Sarah, the scene here is just stunning and shocking at the port of Baltimore. Take a look at the scene right now. The situation is that this vessel, the Dolly, a nearly 1,000-foot-long container ship, is still wedged under where the bridge was. You can look at that vessel there, and you see containers piled on top of it, about six or seven cargo containers high. And there you see the bridge, uh, now a bridge to nowhere, uh, and the wreckage of the bridge uh, span itself in the water tilted to the left from our vantage point. And uh, what you're looking at is a major span for commuters in the state of Maryland around the Baltimore area. Uh, more than 30,000 commuters uh, every day 
crossing that span. Now we'll have nowhere to go. And you look at the containers on that vessel, and that just sort of epitomizes the commerce that comes in and out of this port. Just an enormous port for vessels, more than uh, for uh, automobiles, I should say. More than 800,000 automobiles arrived at this port uh, in 2023. Gives you a sense of check one. Hold on one second here. Economic impact we're going to be looking at. I asked the governor whether. This really quick. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to briefly jump in on Thursday. We're going to have Binky on the show, I believe, at 11 a.m. I just got the phone with him, and we were having a discussion this morning. So I apologize, I can't be here. I've got some stuff coming up. We've got some meetings uh, unanticipated this morning that I have to deal with. Uh, don't I want to be here, but I can't. Uh, but I was speaking with Binky just a few moments ago. And I want to talk to you guys briefly about something uh, that we were, or two things I was discussing with him. We are in a short week on Thursday. So we've got today, tomorrow, and then Thursday, right? There's going to be an expectation from um, dealers knowing that negative flows will come into the market on uh, Thursday. Now, this is hedging flows for Q2 2024. Those flows, when they initially come in in the morning, are typically negative in the, on the market. How, how long they last uh, depends uh, from quarter to quarter. They, I've, seen th I've seen those flows impact the market negatively for one, two hours, all the way up to the entire day. Now, between now and then, uh, we've got a short amount of time before we get there. We have... Uh, one more day. We got today and then tomorrow. Uh, so the expectation, at least from my side, or what I, my thesis here is that um, dealers will run this market up into Thursday or Wednesday close, knowing full well that uh, hedging flows are coming in on Thursday. I think I get this right because uh, I keep wanting to say Friday, of course. If I say Friday, just bear with me. You get the gist, right? It's Thursday. But anyways, these negative flows are going to come in on Thursday. Now, I have to do some research on this, but I was dis I've discussed it in the market brief here and there, but I haven't done the research. Uh, JPM yesterday, GS, all these other banks coming. Uh, like we First, we got the bond boys over the weekend, then we got the banks coming in on, the, on Monday. Uh, and then, of course, even Financial Juice yesterday was piling on with this thesis trying to change sentiment. Uh, which is not an easy thing to do right now, right? Uh, sentiment is a big part of the marketplace. Uh, and there was, a, there was a movement over the weekend to change market sentiment. And there was a further move on Monday from banks to change market sentiment as well. So we're heading into uh, the end of Q1, and um, there's like, hey, we want to make, make a material change to sentiment out there. Now, whether that's true or not, they can or cannot change market sentiment. You see the development of puts to the downside that have been growing over uh, since we, they showed themselves on Monday morning. Uh, and then, of course, this morning, there's a little bit more development of puts. Uh, there's some fear out there whether you know it or not. Uh, now, what I have to look at that I haven't looked at yet is uh, with the collar. Now, if that collar comes out, uh, when that collar comes out, uh, let's say the strikes are higher. Let's say your top strike is 5,500. Uh, so you like 5,500, 5,300, and 5,000 or 4,900, let's say. 4,900, let's say. Uh, 5,300 and 5,500. The, the market should bounce back on Friday. Whatever negativity, negativity comes into the market, uh, the market should bounce back towards end of day. Now, I know that there have been times in the past when the collar comes out wherever current price is, and if that top strike is lower uh, than uh, current market price, we may have uh, an issue because then you've got, uh, you've got the, uh, like the banks putting their money where their mouth is on sentiment. Not just uh, talking, right? Uh, they talk all the time in public, and we know they get run over all the time. Not only that, we know that uh, vol control for, uh, firms are long. We know CTAs are long. Uh, they follow trend, right? Uh, we, and we, 
We know that everybody's long. We know that more money's coming into the market as well as more flows coming into the market uh, that counter any of the flows leaving the market as well. Uh, so there's just a point here where uh, we, we really do want to monitor Friday um, and monitor. I think this particular caller is going to matter in terms of sentiment, like putting your money where your mouth is. Uh, and if the, but if the caller strikes are higher, no matter what they're saying to you, you know that the reaction from or sentiment wise, if the, if the callers are higher, you're going to be like, well, we're calling you, you're bullshit. You even see us going up, right? You see the caller is the top, the top strike is lower than current price in the market. That can uh, shift sentiment, even if it's just in the short term to the downside. Uh, so we'll monitor, I'm going to look into it and try to find some previous callers that came out that the strikes were lower than the price of the market. I think the last one was maybe Q3 or Q4 of uh, 2021. I could be wrong on that, but I think that might have been the last one. I mean, there were, I, and I, mean, I don't mean like um, the caller coming lower in the bear market of 2022, but I mean when the market's going up, like we're, we're going up and the caller, the top strike comes in lower, is what I mean. Uh, so I'll look at that for Thursday for you. Uh, and so look forward to Binky being on Thursday, roughly around 11 a.m. for that. Uh, I'll be back with you guys shortly. I got I to gotta go right back into something right now. Uh, if anything else changes today, I'll let you know. Uh, but I am still bullish here. Uh, we are now above the hourly trigger. We're back tested it. We're just grinding higher and higher and higher. Uh, I'm expecting at some point that we're going to keep moving higher. You guys know if we, uh, if we reject the hourly trigger, <coughs> that's bad, right? It's pretty simple. Try to simplify things for you. As long as we stay above it, we're good to go. Uh, we haven't rejected the hourly trigger at all, and we're climbing. We're hugging it, and we're climbing higher and higher and higher. The expectation here is that we will continue to go higher, uh, knowing that Friday, uh, the morning, uh, should be the morning should be kind of a kind of a negative day. And then there's something else about uh, the day before end of month. I'm not. I'll look into it, but I think that we usually blast off the day before end of month. But I, I'll check. Now, I'll ask Scott and see. Uh, Valwiz knows something about this um, as well. So t tomorrow we might get some fireworks is my point. I'll look into that as well for you today. Uh, but I'll be back with you guys in just a little bit. The, the pace of growth. But in our case, we double the sales of EV last year. Uh, this year we are selling about double what the industry is selling in terms in terms of growth, and if you uh, combine it with the uh, plug-in hybrids, even even more. So things are going well for us. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we have become uh, number two in uh, sales of EV, the global third OEM as a group, and then we are about to start producing EVs in Savannah, Georgia, uh, starting in October this year, three months ahead of schedule. Is that because of the Inflation Reduction Act? Well, uh, that's one of the reasons, not the only one, uh, but definitely uh, we are uh, waiting for uh, the uh, October uh, sales to help us qualify. So far, our vehicles don't qualify, uh, other than uh, during the, uh, in the, in the lease segment. And then, uh, well, hopefully, once we start producing locally, we'll be able to uh, get the full qualification, $7,500 which we're planning to pass on to the customers. There's been a lot of, uh, among the analyst community, mea culpas saying we underestimated the role that hybrids would play as a bridge to this new adoption cycle. Do you, can you talk about how, where you see hybrids fitting in right now? Well, definitely, I think um, the way we see it, uh, we see a very clear path to electrification, right? And then what we see is that uh, a number of customers, they're jumping right into it. Others, <clears throat> they are hearing about it, but they uh, prefer to go into maybe plug-in hybrid or hybrid. And this is why in our case, uh, we are saying we want to be flexible. We want to offer all type of um, uh, motorizations. And in, for example, our most popular Tucson that we are launching a new facelift tomorrow in the New York show, we are launching it with ICE version, hybrid, uh, and also plug-in hybrid. But again, we see the, the biggest growth on EV. So uh, I think the only thing that is happening in the market is that it's taking a little bit longer, the adoption, but there is definitely an EV uh, adoption in the market. But you don't, you don't see any risk of consumers 
staying with hybrids and saying that's good enough for me? Well, I think when you look at it uh, from a long-term perspective, uh, EVs are really better for the environment. They have better. Hey, uh, Trader Podcast, I did just uh, respond to you in Discord, brother. For example, for uh, my uh, okay, good. You know, if you have these type of uh, EV platforms, you can deploy much better all other uh, technologies. So I don't think hybrid is going to be the only solution. And then again, we see more growth uh, still on, on EVs. So uh, we continue to bet on both uh, EVs, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, ice, and hydrogen in our case. Mm -hmm. But so what is it? Just the infrastructure not being there? The infrastructure. Not embracing it? That's right, Sarah. I think the infrastructure is a key uh, success factor, right? So uh, actually, in our